Thank you, everyone, and thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Bumi, and here I'm going to show I'm going to show you how to enhance Anglin performances with Python. First of all, a little bit of an introduction for me. I am from this country here, in this little corner of the map that you never look at. And this country is called Indonesia. I'm specifically from, come from this city, this little city called Bandung, Indonesia. It is the third largest city by population of Indonesia. And it is the home of this little instrument we call Anklung. I'll show you later. So yeah, I was born there. And now I work as a software engineer for Henge, which is based in Tokyo, Japan. So if anyone is interested in working, for, working in Japan, you can go talk to me later. Uh, I have been an Anklung enthusiast for over 10 years. I've been performing in several countries and also have been a conductor in several performances. But here, programming has interested me a lot more. So before that, since uh, high school, I've been interested in programming. And naturally, I've been tinkering with software solutions to solve the problems that appear in Anklung rehearsals and performances. So here, I'm going to show you uh, how, how I do it. So first of all, um, has anyone here ever heard of the Anklung? No? Oh, one person. That's, that's great. So um, this, is a, this is an Anklung. Here I brought an example. So as you, as you can see here, um, the Anklung is, ma is made all of ba from bamboo, from the frame and the two tubes. This is also the frame in the bottom. And then how it produces sound is you, ju uh, you just hold it in the middle, and then you shake it from the bottom corner. That produces a specific tune, specific note, musical note, which uh, depends on the length of the tube of the anklung. So um, this, small, this smaller tube has the same pitch as the bigger tube, but it differs by one octave. So it's only to make the sound stronger. So if I hold this little tube here, it still plays the same note. So it's like this. And then um, this is a smaller example. So as you can hear, these two anklung produce different notes. Oh. Must have kicked the cable there. And OK. So uh, as you can see, we need bigger anklung to produce lower notes, and we need smaller anklung to produce higher notes. So um, you can imagine one anklung as representing one key of a piano. So um, this, the bigger anklung represents the lower notes, which are on the left of the piano, and the smaller anklung uh, produces higher notes, which are on the right of the piano. And as you may know, uh, of course, we cannot play a song, a whole song with only one key of a piano. So we need a lot of anklung, of these anklung with various sizes to produce a song. So this is an example of an anklung orchestra or anklung team, which is performing in a concert hall. This is the uh, anklung team of my high school. And um, as you can see here, there are about more than 20 people here playing. And each of them are holding about um, four or five anklung, each in their hand, and each of those anklung also have different sizes, from the, the little, uh, from the bigger ones about this size to smaller ones about this size. So uh, all of those anklung produce different notes, and all of those notes come together to play a song. And here, I'm going to play for you a sample of the anklung uh, orchestra. <laughs> Okay, so can anyone guess what the title of the song is? You know? Okay, yeah, that's correct. It was the Star Wars main theme. It was played by the Anklung. So this also gives you a, a, a picture of how Anklung can actually, it can play any kinds of song you can imagine. So not only traditional songs, not only songs from my home country, but also any kind of song. 
that is now, uh, if you can hear it, if you can play it on the, on the piano or any other kind of Western instrument, you can also play it on the Anglo. So um, here we are faced um, with a problem. So we have a lot of Anglo with various sizes and a lot of people in a team. So how do we distribute those Anglo to those players? Well, of course, the first thought that comes to mind is that we can just give them randomly, right? We don't need to think about how to distribute them specifically. But in the course of my years of playing Anklung, we found that there are several problems that come with distributing Anklung randomly or really not, not caring about how we distribute the Anklung. So uh, I'm going to introduce you to those um, things. But first, uh, I need to introduce you to the Anklung-specific sheet music or musical score or whatever you call it. So uh, it's how you write the music onto paper or um, digital format. So um, when you imagine a musical score, the thing that comes to mind probably is some kind of this, right? So um, there are several shapes on several lines. Um, there are, there's this uh, shape of the G clef and also the shape of these um, bars, bar lines and stuff. Well, this is a sort of mu uh, sheet music everyone knows, but Anklung does not use this kind of sheet music. It uses different kind of sheet music, which um, when I googled the, the English translation, it is called the cipher notation. Or in Indonesian, we call it not angka. Or when translated literally, it means number, notes. So um, sorry to disappoint you, but cipher notation has nothing to do with cryptography. So cipher here means that we, we encode the notes, the pitches we hear, into numbers. So instead of shapes, like the picture I showed you before, we encode it into numbers like these. So this is an example of Anklung specific sheet music. Um, we read it like usual from left to right. Uh, and then each column here, you can see that these have like some kind of columns. Um, those columns represent one beat of the song. And uh, the bar lines here, they also represent the same thing as the Western sheet music, which uh, represent bars. So you can see here, one bar in this sheet music ha consists of four beats. So the notes here are represented by numbers like this. If you know the Do, Re, Mi song, uh, you also know that um, these notes can also be pronounced Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Si, and then back to Do again. Um, but they don't necessarily mean C, D, E, F, and G. In this format, there is something called uh, relative notes. These are relative notes, and then they can shift. So Do can, can mean C, and it also can mean D, depending on the song that we are playing. So for this example, the Do is equal to F. We can see on the top left corner that the Do, the do is equal to the F. So. Um, we, now we can pay attention to the notes in the same column. As I said, they represent one beat of the song. So that means that those notes that appear in the same column, they must play at the same time in the song, right? So um, the, for example, the, the mi here and the do here has to play at the same time. So what happens if one player holds a mi and a do at the same time? Well, I will show you that it is very hard to play two anklung at the same time. We need to choose which one we want to play. We, this, in this example, it's, very, it's kind of easy, but also it makes the sound very ugly. And sometimes one of the anklung doesn't play. So imagine if there are five anklung, and then we need to play the biggest one and the smallest one at the same time. Well, that's pretty much impossible, so we need to avoid that kind of occurrence. And another thing is that um, there are a, a lot of different notes here, right? And not all of them play um, within the same amount. So for example, uh, this note here, the double lower re here, it only plays one beat throughout the whole song. So imagine if one player holds this anklung and then he just stands there throughout the whole song only, only playing at one beat and then just standing there until the song ends. Well, that is also uh, another thing that we want to avoid. So we want to give uh, a player as many times, uh, as many notes as he can play, but also avoiding collisions like the one I uh, explained before. 
And also, there is one more thing. Uh, we need to uh, take care that the balance of the sizes of the Ankrung that we give to a specific player is um, aesthetically good. So, for example, um, there are Ankrung uh, in, in the extremes that come to this size. So, when I stand here, the Ankrung can be as this big. So, the, uh, the player has to hold it uh, and shake it like this. And then there are some Ankrung which are smaller, actually smaller than this one. It comes to maybe, oops, sorry, maybe as small as this. So it plays the really high notes, and um, we don't want to give one player all of those small anklungs, and we also don't want to give one player all of the big anklungs. So if we give one player all of the big anklungs, then he will become uh, burdened by the size of the anklung, and then he will be uh, unable to play. And also the, big, the smaller anklungs, imagine if one player has to hold five of these small anklungs, then his hand will become very crowded and he couldn't reach each single one. So there are three things that we need to take care about. Um, this is an example of the good balance of the sizes of the anklung. So as you can see here, one player holds a quite big anklung, uh, the size of a table, and also a smaller anklung on his, uh, his fingers. So there can be about five or four anklung, can be more, can be less, depending on the skill of the player. Uh, and we need to distribute them in such a way. So how does Python come into this, you wonder? So first of all, uh, here's another sample of uh, Anklung sheet music. As you can see here, um, there are rows and columns in that sheet music. So probably you can guess how this sheet music is written in a digital form. If you, um, if you notice, then it looks a lot like a spreadsheet. So uh, usually this kind of sheet music is written in a spreadsheet program. Uh, and also, since Excel, Microsoft Excel is used a lot, then uh, fortunately we can read it using OpenPy Excel because in Python there's a library for everything, right? So um, we can use OpenPy Excel to read these sheet music using, uh, my, that are written using Microsoft Excel. So basically, we split the rows, and then we uh, connect the, the rows such that it uh, forms one long row that is the whole song. And then from there, we can see that the rows in the same column should be played together, which means we cannot give the same, uh, those anklung to the same player. And also, we can count the number, the number of how many, uh, how many uh, beats a specific note plays in that song. So we read, we read it from left to right, and then we give it um, cell numbers, like one, two, three, four, five, for, uh, for example. This is the code sample for the, um, for the program that I wrote. Uh, so first of all, we load the workbook, and then we, we iterate through the rows, and then for, from the rows, we iterate through the cells, and then we count all of the notes that appear in that, in that cell. Uh, and then when, when we meet an empty row, like uh, from here, we, need, we meet an empty row, then that means there is another, uh, we need to connect it like this in order to read it correctly. So from there, uh, we, can, we can gather the data about one, sh one sheet music, about the notes in the sheet music, and then uh, how, how those notes interact with each other. And then we, basically summarize the, those, that information into two tables. The first one is uh, what I call a collision table, and another is what I call playtime information. So in the collision table, uh, how you read it is that um, the headers, the column header and the row header, you look at them. So for example, in the top left cell, uh, we can see the do and the re meets 13 times. And then the do and the mi, meets 40 times, which means um, the do and the mi are more likely to collide with each other in the song. So it's, uh, we should avoid giving a combination of do and mi to the same player. Whereas, uh, for example, re and mi uh, only meet, pl play together for two times, which means uh, we, it's kind of safe to give it to, an, to the same player because they only meet once and then well, it can be covered 
uh, by another player in that, uh, in that certain uh, collision. And another, time, uh, another thing is playtime information. So um, in here, it's much more simpler. We only have a list of notes, do, re, mi, and fa. And then uh, the bottom row is the number of occurrences of that song, uh, how many beats uh, that, that note plays in the song. So for example, this do plays 100 beats in the song, and then uh, the mi plays 76 beats, and so on. So it means that we know that um, the, for example, the fa is the one that plays the least in the song, and then we can give it to a player with, uh, with a less uh, number of play, plays, yes? Um, oh, the zeros in, this, in the score. Okay, so the zeros are rests, actually. So, you know, the, the music um, in the Western sheet music, they have a kind of specific shape for a rest, no, no notes. Well, we, here we notate that using a zero. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is the no, actual notes that play, and the zero is a, a rest, so you don't play anything there. And the dots are the, the extenders, so you play the same note as before. And the lines above them are dividers. So if there is a line above a specific column, then that means that beat is divided into two uh, subbeats. So half beat and half beat, and so on like that. OK, so um, here uh, is the basic algorithm of the how I um, create the collision table. So basically, it's um, iterating through all the cells in the table, and then we find um, valid notes in that, in that cell, and then we count the, the, other, uh, uh, the, the other rows, the other notes in that column, and then we count how much they, uh, they appear together. And then after that, in the bottom, we normalize it, so um, the maximum value is one, and then uh, zero point something in, in the middle. And then uh, that's the table of the collision table, and this is the playtime. So this is much simpler. We just go through the whole score, and then we count the number of, uh, in every cell, we just, uh, we just increment the, the uh, playtime of that specific note. And then we find, like for example, this, uh, the minus sign or the minus equal sign means that the, the beat is divided into subbeats, which means that the duration is half or quarter or, or whatever. Yeah, and then uh, same as before, in the bottom we normalize it uh, to gain the uh, playtime as a number between zero and one. And then we optimize the distribution, so based on those three factors that I said before, the minimum num we want the minimum number of collisions for a specific player, but we want the maximum amount of playtime for that specific player also. And we also want a good balance of size of the angling for that specific player. So this is kind of like linear programming where we find the optimum value of, um, of these uh, criteria. But also there is the, the factor of the good balance. So of course, this is still a work in progress and I haven't found the, uh, the right algorithm until now. So, but of course, we, uh, I am still improving uh, uh, according to the results. So this is the final uh, algorithm that I, that I came up with until now, which is basically, um, so there is a, I, I assign a specific weight factor to each anklung that I would give to this anklung, uh, to, a, to a player. So for example, I have several players, um, each of them uh, hold, don't hold an anklung initially, and then uh, I iterate through each anklung, and then I, I determine uh, which player has the, has the biggest weight. So um, if, if the player already has anklung, then I, I reduce the, the weight of that, that player, and then if that anklung, if that player has an anklung that collides with this anklung, then I reduce the, the weight of that player and so on. Uh, well, uh, this has shown, shown uh, varying results. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And, uh, I'm con constantly asking for feedback for, from, my, uh, from my players and then asking them like how, how can I improve this or do you have any ideas or, or, or of how I might 
uh, make this algorithm better. Better. I also tried a different approach one time using genetic algorithms where I um, modeled the Anklung as um, having uh, like, uh, I, I generated a distribution randomly and then I, uh, I calculated the collisions and the playtime and then I, um, I cross produced them and then until, until it uh, makes a specific uh, value, uh, optimum value. So uh, inclusion, in conclusion, there are many possibilities for future improvements of other aspects of Anklung with this technology. Uh, so we can use Python to basically uh, improve the lives of conductors in uh, thinking how, how to distribute the Anklung in, a, in the best way possible. Uh, and I, in this talk, I also skipped a lot of details, including key signatures, the conversion of relative to absolute notes, as I mentioned just before. And uh, I could go on in a deeper detail, but uh, there's the time restriction. So, well, uh, that, that's uh, what I can say today. So thank you, and a, a little proscript, come work in Japan. If you are interested, then please open this link. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot for your explanation about how hard it is to actually prepare a concert. You're still not playing there. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we have time for questions. Um, I'm curious, uh, how do they assign the Anklons to the orchestra now without Python? Uh, um, tri trial and error, is it? Or? Yes, absolutely. So uh, we, before this algorithm, of co uh, we used some kind of trial and error. So we, there's, this, um, there's this system that you can calculate the collisions manually um, using some kind of table. So you, you scan, you read the mu sheet music, and then you mark which anklungs collide with each other, and then you make a distribution based on your judgment whether that uh, anklung is uh, best given to which player, and then you try, try it on the team, and then uh, you find out some errors, and then you switch out the anklungs until it's better. Yeah, so basically try it on error. Maybe I misunderstood the notes. It seems that the notes already have a line per something. Is it like per person or because it's not like ah. everything is grouped together? Yeah, so um, the groups here represent, um, it's easier to show here, I guess. So uh, this sheet music also has um, uh, a big line here and it's also separated uh, like that's the first line, and this is the second line. Well, Anklung sheet music is kind of like that. So um, the, the notes that appear closer together are a chord. So basically, um, they, are, they, they play together, whereas the one that's separated by this empty row is a different part of the song. No, it's not, it's not what I'm asking. It's like, why do you have zeros in the first row, for example? OK, so. Why don't you just group and sort if, if for every column you just have a bunch of sounds together? What are the? Every one row of the three, what does it mean, actually? Oh, one row of the three is the uh, one note. So you can only put one note in one row, and then the zeros there are to s signify that that note stops playing. Yes, but for some reason you would put zero in the first row and one in uh -huh. the second row. Why didn't you put one in the first row? Because the previous note stopped playing, you start playing one, right? Just take an example. Five, mm -hmm. five, one. Why not one, five, Yeah. Why are oh. not they sorted, for example, like, what, what are, oh, there is okay, apparently okay. some meaning to each row. Okay, so it's actually sorted based on the pitch. So if you can see here, the, there are dots in the bottom and dots in the top. The dots in the top mean higher pitch, and the dots in the bottom mean lower pitch. So they are uh, sorted, so um, let's take an example, this bottom row here, five and a three and a one. The five is the lowest note because it has two dots on the bottom, and then the three, is the middle lower note because it only has one dot. And then the one here has no dot, so it's in the middle. But in the very first bar, you have empty row above? Oh yeah, the, the em there are empty rows because not all parts in the song have the same number of uh, notes playing. Why don't you just like, push everything to not have the first row? Like, why don't you have, why do you have the empty row then? Um, uh, sorry, could you repeat? Why wouldn't you just push the second row up to not have the empty row above? 
Oh, um, because that's a different part of a song. So it's not uh, the the three in the top right, uh, the top left, and the three in the top left there don't play together. It's a different part. So you read it like from there to there, and then the very first bar has two rows, empty and non-empty. Mm -hmm. Why do you have the empty row above? Why wouldn't you put the non-empty row above? Uh, the non-empty row is three the, my, three one. Three one five one. Yeah, right? why wouldn't this not be above? Like, why do you have the empty row? Oh, because they play in succession. So after the three, there's the one. Yeah, wouldn't they play in succession if you would have it on the first row and not on the second? First row. Uh, like, move them up 100 oh, pixels. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I understand. So it's basically um, the, the arranger of the song decides where to put those notes. Like, they can absolutely put it on the top row. Yeah, as you said. Uh, why not put it? Why not put the three one five one on the top row? Why leave it empty, right? It's because um, the the uh, the arranger decided to put it there. It's it, it doesn't it doesn't have any difference if you put it on the top or the middle row or the bottom row, but um, it's nice to have the same pitches aligned together. So the the first row there, the first bar has the same pitches, and it's all the lower pitch, which has one dot. So it's better aligned to the one with the lower pitches too. Okay. Yeah, but basically you can you can also put it on the top. It doesn't matter. Okay. So apparently even sheet music is difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question? Yeah, I've got two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one, just to to understand if uh, I got got your idea, uh, the number of player is predetermined. Uh, the number or of players is, is not predetermined, so you can have any number of players, but actually. in your algorithm... Oh, in my algorithm... Uh, do you decide in advance, ah. I will have 20 players and I want to optimize my distribution, or uh, is, it, is it given, or uh, do you try, try and determine uh, what the, the optimal number of players would be for, for a score? Uh, in my specific algorithm, it is predetermined, because... Okay. We know how many players are in that team first, and then we we want to distribute yeah. the young Okay, team. that's what I wanted to know. Yep. And uh, my second question is, mm -hmm. uh, what do you do when you play the next song? Uh, do you, are you trying to optimize uh, for a whole whole set, or do everybody change instruments between songs? How, how, that's a good how does question. It happen? Yes. So um, in this case, I have to um, I have to consider the whole set have to consider the whole performance, um, whereas one performance can have from one song to like uh, five songs in succession. When it has five songs in succession, then I have to join those uh, sheet music together and then put it inside the algorithm and feed it into the algorithm. So yes, uh, to, yeah, to the answer, um, I have to uh, consider all of these songs together as one like large performance. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are now uh, <coughs> going to the spins presentation and uh, next to them the lightning tools. But before that, I propose that we thank Timo for his great talk and explanation about the hard way to make music. Thank you. Thank you.